Good morning, everyone. <laughs> I heard like two of you, so <laughs> good job. You two, you're awake and alive. Well, we're going to sing some songs this morning, so why don't you go ahead and stand and put your hands together and join me as we sing. I think there's any other place that students get to experience the amount of Jesus and the amount of love and service anywhere else. I'm a huge fan of Collide. It all starts just out having fun. I have 
I've done all the things here. There's a bunch of games in the field, like cornhole and spike ball. Usually we come down to the lake at free time because there's a huge lake behind us, like right? Yeah, I know. I'm kind of a fish, so I like water. <laughs> My favorite is the water. I do the high dive, trampoline, tubing, all that fun stuff. Zip line is so much fun. <laughs> and the swing. The swing is something else. It really gets your nerves up. Oh my God! And you just swing back and forth. It's, oh, it's so much fun. We have games, so fun. The reason I lost my voice. <laughs> we go all out, we're painted up, we're glittered up. It is insane. <laughs> it's so cool, just seeing everyone like rally and just like cheer each other on. I've met a lot of new people. And it's just really cool to see how quickly those relationships form. I feel so loved and I know they actually care about me and it makes me like teary. <laughs> Service is just so amazing and God is doing so much in this camp. It's insane and in my life and everyone else's life. Coming to Collide definitely changed me for better. Every year at camp, students have life-changing transformative experiences with Jesus. Everything in the past is taken away and you become a new person and you grow closer to him. When you say yes to Jesus, you get new life. And not just like life that's different, but life that's abundant and life that's full. I struggle a lot with forgiveness and feeling worthy. And that's something we kind of talked about is being worthy. That was one of the songs we sung that really hit me. I felt forgiven. I am constantly worried about what people are going to think of me or what I'm going to be doing or what the next step is. And finally, I'm trusting God blindly and boldly, and it just feels amazing. So our hope is that what started here doesn't stay here, but that it goes back to where they go. That what they experience here would translate to their everyday life. So when I get back, I'm going to try bringing out that calling into my life. I want my friends to see what God is doing in my life and have the same praising the Lord experiences and just feel the love. Well, I don't know about you, but even myself in my ripe old age, remember the impact of one week at camp in summer where you got so much fun, but it packed in full encounters of Jesus and God-sized encounters that were impactful for the rest of my life. And it began my journey of ministry. And so I am all about camps. And I hope that if you have a middle school student or a high school student, that you will go online and sign them up. Registrations have opened and they go quickly. So I encourage you to do this quickly and get them signed up. Or if you know some middle school or high school students that you think would benefit from this, that then get them involved, get them signed up. You can go to eastpointchurch.com and it has all the information there and or you can talk to Ryder, our youth director, and he'll get you hooked up for that. And speaking of youth, I just want to celebrate. This last Wednesday, we reopened our Wednesday night youth activities and meetings and gatherings. So on top of Sunday mornings at 11, we also have middle school and high school students connecting on Wednesdays from 6.30 to 8. And I'm just going to shout out, Ryder did such a great job with the youth that showed up. But not only the youth that showed up, he saw some kids hanging out over at Micah Peak, which is part of our ministry. And he invited them to come over. So they came over, had some Italian sodas, water boom flights, and even heard a little bit about Jesus. So I'm excited about what's happening in our youth group. So I just want to encourage you to get your kids involved or if you know some students that just need some connection and love, be sure to bring them or invite them and let them know that we have this on Wednesday nights. And speaking of getting invited, we are, I want to invite you to be a part. If you have a passion for youth, we would love to get you involved in connecting with our youth on Sunday mornings or Wednesdays. Um, one of the writer's goals is to have some small groups developing. And so we could just have some leaders step in to help with some of those small groups, especially female leaders. We'd love to get some female leaders to step in and connect with some of these young middle school and high school students. So if that's you or somebody you know, let us know. We will get you plugged in. 
Well, I would like to invite you to open up your YouVersion Bible app, as we always do. And that's the best way for you to connect with us for our message notes and all the scriptures and all the things that Kurt will give. It's also a way to see what we have going on. And you can even register for things. You can give. And you can also connect with us by letting us know how we can pray for you. Because we would love to partner with you in prayer. So be sure. But I want to highlight one thing that's happening today. Our Intro to Peace class today at 1230. Go grab a quick lunch. Come right back. Um, it's Intro to Peace, and this is our pathway to missions. This is what we believe about missions, how we reach here in our community, near in our community, and far in our partnership with Africa or other places that we have involvement with. So if you haven't done that, I highly encourage you to do that. Come back today at 1230. And then talking about um, online, did you know you can give online? You can even automate your giving, or you can shop and actually donate. We have all sorts of methods for you to donate and give. So if you'd like, you can open up your U version, and there's a giving portion there, or go online at eastpointchurch.com, or you can give old-fashioned style by putting your off tithe and offering in the black boxes on your way out. Do you know, do you remember, like, every week we talk about tithe and offering? And I just want to highlight today, do you know there's a difference between tithe and offering? There's, there's an and in there. And tithe is what we give 10% of what God has given us in our gross income or the best fruits of our labor. But offering is what goes above and beyond our tithe. Tithe is an ongoing commitment. Offering our opportunities that are presented to us that God says, hey, I want you to go above and beyond and I want you to give maybe some sacrificial giving on behalf of this particular thing that I'm doing. And I'm just going to highlight two things that you can go above and beyond of your tithe. And offering this week, we have our Peace Pantry that opens every single week to the public. And we give out uh, foods and we give out non-perishable items. We give out detergents, household items, cleaning supplies, hygiene items, all sorts of things. And so a way you can go above and beyond tithe is offering and bringing in some supplies to continue helping stock that. We have a made it very easy for you. Every Sunday when you come in, if you have some extra things, there's a box in the front called Peace Pantry Donations, and you can just drop it in there on your way in and out, or even during the office hours, Monday through Thursday from 9 to 4. And then another way that you can go above and beyond your tithe and offering is I mentioned youth. There's another way. If you're not called to be involved with the youth, you know you can actually sponsor a youth to go to camp. For the price of $255, you can pay for a life to be impacted for eternity. And so if that's you and that's somehow you want to be involved in that, you can go to our Give tab on eastpointchurch.com or even through the YouVersion app. And once you click on giving, it gives you an option to designate your donation, your offering, to go to camp and sponsor a kid for camp. So we hope that you can take an opportunity to do that as well. And I know, like I said, offering sometimes is a sacrifice and that's what God calls us to do. But speaking of sacrifice, I want to enter back into a time of worship, and I want to read this verse, Hebrews 13, 15, and it says this, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. Not a common two words that go together, a sacrifice of praise. The fruit of lips that openly profess his name. So in the spiritual world, the word sacrifice and the word praise are often intertwined. See, to praise God in times when we have unanswered prayers or in the difficult times where it causes us to step up in faith a little more or during times when things are painful or uncertain, it takes an act of laying down our will, sacrificing our will, sacrificing our agenda to say, no matter what, I can still praise God. That's a sacrifice of praise, laying down what we want to say, God, you're still good. God, you will still provide. God, I still believe in you. And so I'm going to invite you to stand today. And as we sing these next couple of songs, go ahead and stand with us. I want you to, alongside with me, make the sacrifice of praise. God, I know I'm still wanting this. God, I know I'm hurting in this. But I'm still choosing that you're good and you still have great things. Let's think about those as we sing.
going to sing about the great things that God has done and praise Him this morning.
freely give it all to you. All to you. In Jesus, Jesus, my heart. Is it? 
this morning and we're surrendered to you Lord have your way in our hearts and in this place we just want to sit in your presence and be with you Lord speak to us we love you and we praise you Oh, 
Lord, we love you and we praise you this morning. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to be with you, to have relationship with you and to know you. You're so good to us. We love you and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks so much for singing this morning. You can go ahead and take a seat. Epic students, you are dismissed. And please join me in welcoming Pastor Kurt. Morning, guys. Thanks for being here today. Whether you're joining us online or in person, it's good to see you guys. Thanks for being a part of our service today. Uh, thanks for praying for me as well. Uh, last uh, week, I had the old-fashioned flu, stomach flu. And uh, yeah, it, I think it's still around. But apparently so, because I had it and spent a, a great deal of time bowing before the great white throne of judgment. Let's just put it that way. So uh, uh, enough said about that. But it is good to be alive and be with you guys. Thanks for being here today. You know, as an author and a speaker, uh, I have a love-hate relationship with cliches. Uh, I love them because they're easy to remember and they often communicate truth. There's something really cool. They become a cliche because they're good. What I hate about them is they're cliche and everybody knows them. In fact, just a little pop quiz just to take you through an example of this. Um, I'm going to give you the first part of the phrase and you repeat or give me the, the, the tagline. Grass is always greener. Yeah, you guys are smart. Don't judge a book. Better safe then. Actions speak louder than, and what doesn't kill you only makes you, unless you're really sick like I was. I'm not sure that's true, but <laughs> the cliche that I want to connect to my talk today is this one. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And here's the reason why I want to kind of start with that today. It's because as Christ followers, we of all people ought to care the most. And one of the things that'll mark our lives, if you belong to Jesus, if you follow him, one of the things that'll mark your life more than, than normal, way more than what we see in our culture, is that you care about the poor, the broken, and the disenfranchised. That you care about the people Jesus cared about. Teresa, as you go to your version Bible app, and hopefully you've got that open, and uh, I, there you'll find the text today. It's Matthew 5, chapter 5, verse 14 and 16. I'm talking about how to live in the light, how to live like Jesus. Let me pick up Matthew 5, verse 14. You are the light of the world. This is Jesus speaking. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. Verse 16, in the same way. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Let me read that last part again. Let your light shine. Whose light? Your light as a Christ follower. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works, your good deeds, and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. To set the tone and to illustrate that this morning, I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Teresa to come back up and to read you a, a modern day fable uh, from one of my favorite authors, Max Licato wrote this, and uh, she does such a great job. What's that? And yeah, anyhow, so I'm going to have her read the story for us right now. Finding Father Benjamin. Unfavorable winds blew their ship off course, and the sailors spotted several uncharted islands. They saw half a dozen mounds rising out of the blue South Seas. The captain ordered the men to drop anchor and went ashore. He was a robust man with a barrel chest, full beard, and a curious soul. On the first island, he saw nothing but sadness. Underfed children, tribes in conflict, no food development, no treatment for the sick, and no schools. Just simple, poor, and needy people. The second and following islands revealed more of the same. The captain sighed at what he saw. This is no life for these people, but what can he do? Then he stepped onto the last and largest island. The people were healthy and well-fed. Irrigation systems nourished their fields and roads connected their villages. The children had bright eyes and strong bodies. The captain asked the chief for an explanation. How has this island moved so far ahead of the others? The chief, who was smaller than the captain, but every bit his equal in confidence, gave a quick response. Father Benjamin. 
He educated us in everything from agriculture to health. He built schools and clinics and dug wells. The captain asked, can you take me to see him? The chief nodded and signaled for two tribesmen to join him. They guided the captain over a jungle ridge to a simple, expansive medical clinic. It was equipped with clean beds and staffed with trained caretakers. They showed the captain the shelves of medicine and introduced him to the staff. The captain, though impressed, saw nothing of Father Benjamin. He repeated his request. I would like to see Father Benjamin. Can you take me to where he lives? The natives, the three natives, looked puzzled. They conferred among themselves, and after several minutes, the chief invited, follow us to the other side of the island. They walked along the shoreline until they reached a series of fish ponds. Canals connected the ponds to the ocean, and as the tide rose, fish passed from the ocean into the ponds. The islanders then lowered gates and trapped the fish for harvest. Again, the captain was amazed. He met fishermen and workers, gatekeepers and net casters, but he still saw nothing of Father Benjamin, and he wondered if he was making himself clear. I don't see Father Benjamin. Please take me to where he lives. The trio talked alone again, and after some discussion, the chief offered, let's go up the mountain. They led the captain up a steep, narrow path, and after many twists and turns, the path deposited them in front of a grass-roofed chapel. The voice of the chief was soft and earnest. Here, Father Benjamin taught us about God. He escorted the captain inside and showed him the altar, a large wooden cross, several rows of benches, and a Bible. Is this where Father Benjamin lives? The captain asked. The men nodded and smiled. May I please talk to him? Their faces grew suddenly serious. Oh, that would be impossible. Why? asked the captain. Because he died many years ago. The bewildered captain stared at the men. I asked to see him, and you showed me a clinic, some fish farms, and this chapel. You said nothing of his death. You didn't ask about his death, the chief explained. You asked to see where he lived, and we showed you. I love that story. Thank you, Teresa. Let's give it up for her. Give it up for her. Yeah. Thank you, Teresa. I, I love that fable because it illustrates something that I want you to understand. The fable, the moral to that is simple. Leave a living legacy. Let people see what your life was about through the good deeds that you've done, through the things left behind you, the good deeds that you've done for others. Again, you and I are supposed to be lights in the midst of a very dark and broken world. That's Jesus' intent for you and me. Why? Because as Christ followers, we get to do what Jesus did. The big idea today, here's what I want you to walk away with. When you are close to Jesus and you know his heart and have his compassion, you will follow him to the margins. When you are close to Jesus, when you're intimate with him, you will know his heart, have his compassion, and you will follow him to the margins. Now, what do I mean follow Jesus to the margins? By that, I mean that you will go to the disenfranchised, to the broken, to the needy, to the sick, to the marginalized of our culture, just like Jesus did. It is amazing to me that in Matthew, Jesus said, you are the light of the world. And he made this statement in John 12, 46. John 12, 46, Jesus said, I have come in, as, into the world as light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. See, Jesus said, I am the light. I'm the one who came as the light into the world. And you get the opportunity now to be light just like me, just like Jesus, who was the light of the world, our lights get to shine in the midst of a world trapped by heartache and pain. And by darkness, we get to shine as light. Now let me point out a couple of things before I move on because I want you to understand what light does and doesn't do. Light does not mean that we are judgmental hammers where we project a better than other mentality. It's a healing light that we bring. Light is good and helpful. A light that reveals doesn't destroy. A light that, shine, a light that shines, but it doesn't blind. I thought about bringing one of those laser lights in and like, you know, show you, you know what I'm talking about. It's not supposed to be that kind of light where it hurts people. It actually helps them. 
We must live with the light of Jesus within us, bringing life and hope to a watching and desperate world. And today, I want to talk about what we need to understand for that to happen. What needs to take place in us for us to actually let our, let our light shine? What we need to understand, and here's the first thing of the three I'm going to cover. Number one, change begins when you have eyes to see in the heart of Jesus. Change begins when you have eyes to see in the heart of Jesus. And I thought about just landing on this and making this the only point today because this really is the most important thing. Nothing else I'm going to talk about will happen until this takes place in your heart. See, here's something I know about us, about human nature, about you and me. Until our eyes are open and our hearts are broken, nothing truly changes. Until our eyes are open and our hearts are broken, nothing will change. I could tell you a thousand scriptures and a hundred stories today. But until you see what God wants you to see, and you see people through the eyes of Jesus, and until you have the compassion and the heart of God for the marginalized and the broken, then nothing's really going to change in you. Why do I know that? Well, because, again, I know human nature, and I know my story. For years, a big chunk of my life, sadly, I will tell you that I live without eyes to see, without compassion of Jesus. In fact, I live with a pretty harsh and judgmental attitude towards the marginalized. Most of you know that uh, in my 20s, I worked for about 10 years in the banking industry. I wasn't always a pastor. And I used to work downtown, the first interstate tower, downtown L.A., and I would drive from where I lived to downtown. It was about a 45-minute drive one way. That's if traffic wasn't bad. And every day it was bad. But generally, it would take me about 45 minutes or so to get downtown. And my drive would take me right through Skid Row. Right through. Because it was the most direct way to get to the parking garage where I would, would land. So I'd drive right through Skid Row every day. And I'll be honest with you, I hated it. I absolutely hated it. I was disgusted by this, these people. I had an attitude about them. I was harsh. I'm embarrassed to tell you, I was really harsh and judgmental in my attitude. And more than once, I just would get irritated, especially when they come up and they try to clean my windows and they'd ask for a handout. Sometimes they scared me and I didn't like that part of my drive at all. The irony in all of that is that I, I, almost every day I would listen to Christian music. So here I am listening to Christian music about God, love you, and, and I'm driving past these people hating them. Not at all like Jesus, and I'm just being honest with you. Well, one day I'm driving into the parking garage, and some of you old timers will remember a guy named Keith Green. And Keith Green was a musician, cutting edge at the time, and a radical, and loved Jesus. And he's, was, there was a song on the radio called Asleep. In the, uh, in the light, asleep in the light. And I'm listening to that song, and it was just one of those moments where God just grabbed hold of me. I pulled my car into the spot. I stopped. I turned the car off, and I just left the radio on and kept listening. And the, and the more I listened, the more it just began to pierce my heart. I ended up sobbing, actually, in my car, just weeping in my car as the words about, you know, us being numb to the needs of people around us and that the church was asleep in the light. That we had the light of God and yet we didn't do anything about it or with it. And I got busted. I, I was deeply and profoundly impacted by that song to again have the heart of God for those who are marginalized. I want you to take a picture. And when you look at this, what's your initial reaction? I mean, do you have compassion? Or perhaps a little bit of, eh. Or maybe it's like, ah, there's so many. You know, maybe it's like, there's just too many people like that. What can I do? Do you look at someone like that and, and does your, your heart ache a little bit? You wonder, you know, that's someone's daughter, maybe someone's mother or sister. Is there part of you that actually begins to look at them through the eyes of Jesus? Here's what Matthew wrote about Jesus in Matthew 9, 36. Matthew said, when he, Jesus, saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Matthew said, when Jesus saw the broken, when Jesus saw the disenfranchised, when Jesus saw people, he had compassion on them. And the two words in there that I want to underline is he saw. I'm telling you, we have to have the eyes that see. Eyes that see with compassion and love. When we have eyes to see in the heart of Jesus, that's when things begin to change in us and through us. One of the most powerful prayers you will ever pray is, God, help me see what you see. Jesus, help me have your heart. God, give me the eyes of Jesus. Give me the heart of Jesus. It's one of the most powerful prayers you can pray. And I know that for two reasons. One, because if you pray that, God will answer that prayer. And two, is as that begins to happen in your life and in you, it'll transform you from the inside out. 
you'll see things differently. You'll see people differently. You know, people ask me, and I have this conversation from time to time, well, if God's alive, if God's so good, then why is there so much poverty in our world? Why are there so many poor people? I, I met a, a man in our service today from Ethiopia, and I have two Eritrean granddaughters. And one of the things that's sad and true right now happening in Ethiopia is that there are hundreds of thousands of people at risk of dying from starvation. Africa's in a horrible position, many parts of the country, but Ethiopia in particular, right now, hundreds of thousands of people at risk of dying. And we hear stories like that, and we go, how can there be a God? Or maybe you're aware of this, and this is something that I'm very aware of, having been to Africa many times, is that about 200 million people a year still suffer from malaria. And many of them suffer so much that, that uh, they never recover or they die. And 60% of the people who suffer from malaria, especially on the African continent, are under five years of age. And here's what's frustrating about that. Listen, it's curable, it's preventable, and it's curable. Malaria is not AIDS. We, you know, 40 years of the AIDS crisis, we still don't have a vaccine. Malaria is both preventable and curable, and yet it kills millions of people every year. And people say, how can you believe in a good God with stuff like that? Well, things like that happen in our world. And when I hear that, I ache a little bit, and then I gently reply to them with this simple statement. God has given an answer, and it, its answer is supposed to be you and me. The problem is we don't see the needs through the eyes of Jesus. We don't have enough of the compassion of our Father. Now, I am not, listen carefully, I am not saying that to guilt or to shame anyone. Shame is not God's desire for you, and guilt is a really lousy motivator. If you grew up like I did in a church that was really good at guilting people, how well did that work to keep you on the narrow, straight and narrow? Not very well. I mean, you did good until you were out of someone's sight or until you got past the guilt and, and, and numbed enough of your guilt with whatever. Guilt and shame are not the answer. We're not doing that here. But your eyes must be open because when your eyes are open, you won't be numb to the needs of the needy. You won't turn a deaf ear to the cries of the crushed. You'll never walk by a homeless person again without this prayer being on your lips. Jesus, what can I do to make a difference here? What can I do? I understand that some of us suffer from compassion fatigue. That's a phrase that's become fairly well known in our culture because so many of us just see so many needs all the time. Never before in the history of humankind, never before have we had more exposure to the, 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 the disease, to the brokenness, to the poverty, to the war, to the tragedies that are around the globe. Never before in all of history. We can turn on our radio, turn on our, our, our social media, turn on the television and be exposed to it all the time. And what happens is we just see so much of it, we get compassion fatigue. It's like, why can't I really, what can one person really, I can't fix everything, I can't deal with all this. I've got a life, I've got, and it, it's just something we struggle with in our culture today. We can't fix everything and we can't change everyone. But listen, you can impact one life. You can impact one life today and then one life tomorrow and one life at a time we can make a difference. But that does not and will not happen until you have eyes to see, until you have the heart and the compassion of Jesus. Here's the second thing you need to understand. Number two, your light shines best when you are selflessly serving. So first you need to see and then you need to selflessly serve. Just like Jesus if you are a Christ follower, then guess what? You don't have to pray about this. You don't have to say, well, I, let me check in later and see if this is something God wants me to do. No, the Bible is clear about this. Jesus was clear about this. You get to selflessly serve to meet the needs of others. If our Lord, if the creator of everything, if the son of God, if Jesus, who deserved to be served above all, chose to serve others rather than be served, and we follow him, then guess what? That's our call as well. In his very first message, Jesus declared his mission to serve the disenfranchised and his passion for the poor and the broken, the wounded, and the oppressed. And I've taught from this passage many times over the years. It's found in Luke 4, 18 and 19. Let me just read it to you. Uh, I refer to this as the kingdom manifesto because this is what Jesus said. He read from the book, the prophet of Isaiah, and he said, this is what I'm all about. First message, first time Jesus taught. This is what he said, Luke 4, 18 and 19. The spirit of the Lord is upon me 
For he, God, has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, prisoners will be set free, that the blind will see that the oppressed, those who are oppressed and bound and suffer, will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. Jesus was clear about his mandate from God. He was clear about his mission. And then in everything he did, he demonstrated that he did not come as royalty to be served, but as one who would selflessly sacrifice and serve others, give his very life away for the benefit of others. And Jesus did so as a model for you and me. Not just for pastors or leaders or select few, not just for the Mother Teresa's in our world, not just for people who are like really radical crazies, but for every one of us who say Jesus is our Lord, we get to live as he lived. Jesus said this in Mark chapter 10, verse 43 and 45. Mark 10, 43 to 45. Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, when Jesus taught this to the crowd, to the people, to the disciples, they were flabbergasted, blown away by this statement. The first part, when he said, whoever wants to be great among you, I'm imagining Jesus pausing there, a little pregnant pause. Whoever wants, who wants to be great? And they're all like leaning in. Yeah, sign me up. Jesus, show me the steps to successful life. Show me how to be great, because I want to be great. And the disciples had that argument on a regular basis. Jesus said, okay, here's the answer. You want to be great? Here's the path. Serve. And in fact, become a slave. Now, the impact of those words in the 21st century don't have quite the same impact as it would have had to the original hearers when Jesus taught that. Because when they heard that, they would have thought, whoa, time out. Slave? No, it's slaves were the bottom of the bottom, the least of the least. Nobody aspired to be a slave in Jesus' day. But Jesus said, here's the deal. You want to be truly great. You want to be great in the kingdom of God. Here's the way. Here's the path. Selfless service to others. In fact, so much so that you take the position of a slave. Fame in the kingdom of God is not found in fortune, but in selfless sacrifice. It's not found in you, what you can get out of it. We live in such a culture, such a consumer, me-driven culture, where it's, well, what do I get? What about me? What about me? And Jesus always made it clear, that's not the point. It's what can I do for you? As we follow the one who was the light of the world, as we do good works for the benefit of others, that's when we shine as lights in the midst of darkness. And the best way Listen carefully. The best way for your light to shine is through good deeds. Now, we don't do good deeds to get saved. The Bible's clear about that, too. We don't do good deeds to somehow appease the wrath of God. We don't do good deeds just to earn something from God. We do good deeds because God's done the ultimate great deed for us. But we demonstrate our heart, our light, our relationship with Jesus as we do good deeds for others. As you sacrifice, yes, I love that Teresa referred to that earlier. As you sacrifice your time, talent, and treasures for others and for the kingdom of God, you shine. As you become foster parents and adopt a child, you shine. As you provide food and supplies for the poor, helping us bring food for our pantry and be a part of that ministry, you shine. As you help a disabled senior citizen or a widow, you, you shine. James says, pure and undefiled religion is this, to care for the widows and orphans. That's pure and undefiled religion. That's what the Bible says. That's when you shine. As you reach across racial, social, and economic barriers, that's when you shine like Jesus. As you love the broken and the poor, you shine. And that's what God wants for all of us. Now, I admit it to you already that I've struggled with this and I've wrestled with this and I've been in process of learning how to do this better myself for some time, some time now. But uh, middle of COVID, I was downtown and it was pretty much a ghost town. There weren't hardly anybody, hardly people down there except a lot of homeless people. And I was hungry, so I decided to have some health food, so I walked into Mod Pizza. That was a joke. Mod pizza is not health food, in case you're wondering. But I decided to go in and order pizza. And I ordered, you know, God's gift to the world, pepperoni pizza without pineapple. 
and I had a pepperoni pizza. I devoured that pretty quickly, walked outside, and some people stand, sitting out there, a couple of guys, homeless guys, and one of them chimed up and said, hey, uh, can you spare any change? Got any money? And I honestly did not have any money or change. I rarely have cash on me at all. I, but as a, as a rule, I don't give money to people that I don't know what they're going to do with it. Even the Union Gospel Mission says don't give money to homeless people. It just doesn't help them. So I said, guys, I don't have any money. I really don't. But even if I did, be honest with you, I wouldn't give it to you. They kind of looked at me. I'm getting ready. I thought they were going to like. And I, and I said, but here's what I can do. Follow me inside and I'm going to buy you guys a pizza. They're like, seriously? I said, yeah, go on in. I'll buy you a pizza. So we walk in and the Mod Pizza folks are a little put out, I'm sure, because they aren't excited about these guys being around half the time anyhow. And I said, go ahead, get, jump ahead in line. You order, I've already eaten. And order whatever you want. Anything but beer. And I said, whatever you want, because they do serve beer in mine. I said, whatever, whatever you want. And of course, they order the biggest thing that they could get and put everything on it. And I didn't care. Got done, paid for the pizza. They walked outside, they sat down. And they're like, dude, that's so cool. Thanks, man, for buying this pizza. Like, and I said, guys, I said, I, I, I need you to understand something. Listen to me. I said, I did this because I want you to know something. I want you to know that God loves you. He loves you. I said, and while you're eating this pizza, let this just be a real simple reminder. I said, I'm not going to preach at you. I'm not going to hammer you. I'm not going to you know, do anything weird right now, except I just want you to remember this. This pizza is a, is a reminder to you that God loves you. And that day... The light of Jesus shined a little brighter through me. And that's what the Father wants for all of us. All of us. We are called to sacrificially serve the needs of others. You can't do everything, but you can do something. And so be great. Be great by Jesus' definition. Today, be great. Tomorrow, be great. The next day, be great. Be great. And that path to greatness is selfless sacrifice, serving others. And let it become such a normal thing for you that it's like breathing. You know, not one of you have been sitting here this morning thinking, oh, I forgot to breathe. I need to take that next breath. Wait, did I breathe? No, you just do it without even thinking about it. And I want this to become so normalized for us as East Pointers and as Christ followers that we just serve without even thinking. It's our second nature just to do it. We do it on a regular basis. All right, here's one final thing. Number three. One final thing I want you to understand. The blessed are blessed to be a blessing. The blessed are blessed to be a blessing. Now, I know that some of you may be struggling financially, and some of you are without jobs, and some of you, uh, you have taken some pretty fi serious financial hits. I, I understand. But I also know this, that compared to many in our world, even the poorest East Pointer is wealthier than most true. I mean, I like that reality, but true. Now, you compared to somebody living on the South Hill in a million and a half, you know, a, a, a dollar home, it's, yeah. But us, most of us, compared to most of the world, are wealthier than most. And again, I don't say that to make you feel guilty or in any way to shame or manipulate you. We don't do that here. But the simple fact is there are two to three billion people on the planet who would give anything to have what you have. And they, they have far, far less than what you can even imagine. We take so much for granted. I've been all over the world. And I've been to villages, many of them, where they have to walk a long ways just to get a bucket of dirty water. And we take for granted that we can turn on a faucet and get you know, water right out of the sink. We take for granted that we have a roof over our heads, that we have more than one meal a day to eat, that we have access, most of us, to good medical care. Why do I bring that up? Oh, you're just making me feel bad. No, that's not why I'm bringing it up. What I'm trying to do is put this in context. We think we don't have much. You, oh, I said the blessed are blessed to be a blessing. About half of you are going, well, pff, good. Leaves me off the hook because I sure ain't blessed. And I'm trying to say, no, you truly are. The truth is we are blessed. And what does God want us to do with that blessing that he's given to us? He wants us to be generous. Here's one passage of many I could read. 1 Timothy chapter 6, 17 and 19. Paul wrote, Teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money. But, uh, because money is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God, who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. 
Verse 18, tell them to use their money to do good. Listen, tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and good deeds and generous to those in need. Always be ready to share with others. And by doing this, they will be storing up treasure as good foundation for the future so that they may experience true life. I'm not going to teach from this passage. I'm going to give you four things that Paul says here, though. Number one, teach those who are rich, meaning this does not come naturally. Number two, don't trust in money, which is so unreliable. Trust in God. That's a good word for all of us. Number three, as long as you've got it, don't hoard it. Bible, Old and New Testament teaches that again and again. Don't hoard, share. And number four, God records and God rewards. I love that. God records and God re rewards. But the point here is that work done in Jesus' name will outlive our earthly lives. And God uses that truth to motivate us. You want to leave a living legacy? Then do good works for the benefit of others. Well, how? And where? What does that look like? Well, right now, in your neighborhood, where you go to work, where you go to school, where you go to church, in your city and beyond, there are countless opportunities to live for others and to make your life count. More opportunities than you've probably ever imagined. And how does that become a, a, a known to you? Well, first, you've got to ask God to give you eyes to see, to give you his heart. And then you've got to choose to make the choice to selflessly serve. And then you've got to say, God, whatever you've given me, maybe I have just a little bit more than that guy, but I can share. I want to be a blessing to others. My encouragement to you today is to live your life in such a way that the world around you will be glad that you did. And by the way, don't just pray for people. Now, pray. That's a good thing to do. Pray. Pray for the poor. Pray for those in need. Every time you drive by a, a homeless person or somebody in need, of course I want you to pray. But here's the catch. Listen to me. Are you willing to be an answer to your prayers? See, it's really kind of religious, let's be honest, to just pray. Oh, God, I pray for that homeless person there. May you just bless them, Lord. And that's a good place to start. But are you willing? Listen, this is a serious question. Are you willing to be an answer to your own prayers? Are you willing to do something? Peter wrote this in 1 Peter 2.12. Live such good lives among the pagans, those who don't believe in God, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God. And why is this so important? Why does this matter so much? Because good deeds create good will, and good will gives us the right to share the good news. Why does this matter so much? Because our good deeds will create goodwill, and goodwill gives us the opportunity to share the good news. I'm going to say something now that may upset a few of you. I'm not in trying to do that. I never intentionally try to make people mad, believe it or not. But I'm going to say something that I want you to think about. The church was never meant to just be an organized religion with a political agenda. We are an organized community, a community given together the mandate to serve others with the heart of Jesus. We are called to do this together, to serve others in Jesus' name, to selflessly serve. An African pastor friend of mine named Morgan once said this, a church that lives within its four walls is not a church at all. Listen, I love church. I love doing this with you. I love what God's doing at East Point. But a church that just lives within its four walls, eh, that's not really church, not the way God defines it. So in our community, in our community of faith, if this is your church home, if this is where God's planted you, then I want you to understand that together we share in this mission. This is not just for a select few. Well, it's, I'm not called to that. Bullpucky. <laughs> yep, we are. Yes, you are. We're all called. We're all called to see. We're all called to have the heart of Christ. We're all called to, called to serve selflessly. And we're all called to be a blessing, every single one of us. We may not be the biggest church in town. We might not be the best church in town. But we are a church with a clear mandate to go. Our five purposes, love, connect, serve, grow, go. And we go local here within our community of faith. We serve one another. Sitting right back there was a, as a, in the first service was a widow that our house group serves on a regular basis. 
That's we go local, we go here, we go near, we go into our community, and that's part of what we do with the pantry, and we go far. And you know, the intro to peace class, one shameless plug, come back for that. Go get some tacos at Taco Bell, come back for the 1230 class today, back in the training center. Because it, people hear, what's well, about missions? Yeah, mission, here, near, and far, about our call to go, our fifth purpose. And that's our God-given mandate. It's what God wants for every one of us. I'm gonna finish with one last story, and I'm done. Years ago, I was on staff at a church in Oceanside, California. Helped plant, start that church up long, long time ago. And this is when Oceanside was a dive. Uh, some of you, if you were in the Marines or in the military there, you, you have probably some pretty ugly memories of Oceanside because it was a terrible place to go to. Not a cool place at all. But we planted a church there. And we started in a boys and girls club. And boys and girls clubs generally are put in poor neighborhoods. So we're in Oceanside, which now is really upscale and cool. Back then it wasn't. So we're in a poor neighborhood, in a poor city, plant a church. And I was standing in the back uh, by the, the doors, like I still do to this day. I was on staff at this church. And the guy walked into the door, and he's obviously homeless. And lots of homeless people back then in Oceanside, tons of them. He walks in with a backpack, a, a bedroll, looked like he hadn't bathed in weeks. It smelled like he hadn't bathed in weeks. Dirty clothes, and, it's, and he walks up, and, and it's, if you had lit a match next to this guy, there would have been an explosion. I mean, that's, it was just that bad. And he said, dude, can I get some coffee, man? I get some coffee. And I said, yeah, sure, come on in. Put your backpack down. I'll keep an eye on it. Go grab some coffee. And there's, in fact, there's a donut over there. Thanks, man. Walked over and got a cup, cup of coffee and donut. And I looked over. I'm still at the door. I looked over, and I told him I'd watch his stuff, so I am. And one of the guys who was not at that time on staff, but one of my friends, Don Gerald, Big Don. Still love this guy. Still know him. In fact, we communicated this last week. But Don Gerald goes over, makes a beeline for this guy. Comes to find out his name is Gunner. The guy, the homeless guy's name is Gunner. Don walks up, and I don't know how he knew, but he figured out this guy was a vet, and Don was a vet, and they start having this conversation, and, and, and Don does what Don did. Don said, hey, Gunner. I said, man, as soon as you got your cup, cup of coffee and your, your donut, so let's put your stuff behind the counter over here and make sure it's taken care of, and why don't you come and sit with me and my wife, Sharon, in church? And Gunner kind of looks down at himself like, Dude, I'm not dressed for church. And I, somehow Don said, it, none of that really matters. Just come, sit with us during service today. All right. And that began this journey. And I, I get choked up every time I think about it. This journey for Gunner, where he came. First week he was there, he sat in the back next to Don and bawled the entire service. Bawled. So he came back the second week and cried some more. And week after week after week, he kept showing up. And week after week after week, Don just kept loving on Gunner. Took him out to lunch after church, hung out with him, did different things with him, began to get to know his story. Gunner was divorced, separated from his wife and kids, an alcoholic, suffered from PTSD, and they really didn't even know much about that back in that time, dealing with all sorts of stuff. And Don just wrapped his arm around Gunner and led Gunner to Jesus. And today, Gunner's back with his wife, with his kids, Loving Jesus. And I tell you that story because one person named Don made the difference in one person's life. That, and the ripple impact of that continues to change lives. You are to be light. You get to be light. You don't have to be. You get to be light just like Jesus. Bye, Let me pray for you. Father, I, I, um, I pray now that you would do what only you can do. You would reach into our hearts and change us. That you'd reach into our souls and transform us from the inside out. That you would give us eyes to see and hearts filled with compassion. And some of us, Lord, maybe we've been experiencing that for a long time and we we're already on that path, on that journey. But maybe some of us are struggling with compassion fatigue. Would you just rejuvenate our, our, our souls, re, re, refuel our hearts today? Give us more of you, God. Enlarge the capacity of our hearts to receive more from you. And let us begin to see the people around us, whether they're working in the cubicle next door to us or homeless on the street. 
Let us see them through your eyes, Lord. And look for opportunities to selflessly serve them. Look for ways to be a blessing in their life. Because that's what you did, Jesus. Help us be more like you. Keep your head bowed and your eyes closed if you would for a minute. Maybe you're here today and you've not yet started your life as a Christ follower. And I don't know how you ended up here. Maybe you're watching online right now and you just kind of happened on to this website and you're watching right now. And you know in your heart, you know in your gut, there's something in you that just knows that today is your day. You, this is your moment. This is your opportunity to respond to the love of God like you never have before. And you know you need a Savior. And you, know need, you need forgiveness. And you know you need God's mercy and grace in your life. And if you know that, then why not respond to that? Why not say, okay, God, I surrender. I'm going to give you my life just like Jesus, you gave your life for me on that cross. I'm going to accept what you did for me personally. And I'm going to receive that gift of salvation today. And it's just that. It's receiving. You accept what Jesus did for you on the cross. You accept his gift of forgiveness and mercy and grace and salvation in your lifetime. And it happens as you open your life and surrender your past, your present, even your future to me and say, God, I need you. Jesus, I need a Savior. And today I choose to follow you. And if that's what you want, if that's your decision, then just make this prayer yours right now. Father, thank you for sending Jesus for me. I need a Savior. I need saving. I need forgiveness and mercy. I see it like I've never seen it before, and I want you in my life, God. I want to follow your son. I want to live as light in the midst of this dark world, and I don't want to add to the darkness. I want to add to the light by being like you, Jesus. And so today, I surrender. Today, I receive. Today, I become your child forever. Now, if that's you, that's your heart, your own way to say, yeah, God, that's me. And the moment you do, that instant you say yes to him is that instant, that instant that now you become his child. You belong to Jesus and he belongs to you. And you've begun this journey now. It's going to take you from here into eternity as a child of God. Lord, thank you for that. Thank you for what you're doing and that heart, those hearts, and for what you're doing in all of our hearts today. And it's in your amazing and mighty name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to finish with one last song of worship. Some of you are going to sing this song today as a declaration of what God has done for you. But let's worship. I'll come back and wrap it up.
that song, God loved the world so much that not only did he send Jesus, but he sent you and me. Isn't that amazing? He sent us. Today, if you begin your life as a Christ follower, come tell me or tell somebody you came with today. It'll make their day. And in the baskets on the tables, as you walk uh, out by the doors, there's a packet, a uh, little brown bag that still begins this wonderful adventure. It's got a Bible, some material to get you started. You can walk with Jesus. Grab one of those. If you're watching online, you know, like us to mail one to you, just e uh, please email us at answers at eastpointchurch.org and we'll send one to you. I love you guys. Thanks for being here. We're going to uh, wrap up this little mini series next, next week, talking about how to build bridges to those who are far from him. And uh, just because we can, I asked Ty to find it. We're going to play as a walkout song, Keith Green's Asleep in the Light. God bless you guys. See you next week. <laughs>